Once upon a time in ancient China, there was an old musician who was completely lost in his music, singing a song about a warrior named Wang Xiaoxi. Not far from him, Wang Xiaoxi himself was leading his horse along the road. He stopped for a moment to listen to the familiar names in the song. Beside him, there was a box filled with ashes. The curious old musician couldn't help but ask Xiaoxi about what was inside the box. With a touch of sadness in his voice, Xiao Xi explained that the ashes belonged to someone very dear to him, and he was on a quest to find a special place to lay them to rest. Before they went their separate ways, Xiao Xi wanted to know the name of the song that brought back so many memories, and the old musician told him it was called The Hero. Let's take a step back in time, about 10 years ago in China. In those days, heroes and warriors admired two main groups, the Lu Finban sect, who were mainly focused on gaining wealth, and the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion, known for their commitment to justice and wisdom. In the peaceful Beishu Park, Xiaoxi was being trained by Xu Xiaoyi, and one day, he was entrusted with a very important task. He had to deliver a precious white jade box to Su Meng Zun, who lived in the bustling capital city. Xiao Yi stressed how crucial this mission was, explaining that the box held great significance for Meng Zun's future leadership in the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion and it was absolutely essential that it reached him directly. At the same time, things were heating up in Xili village. The warriors of the Lufenban sect, gathered together after Lei Chun, the daughter of their leader, shared some interesting news. She had information about the valuable jade box we mentioned earlier, and she knew it was being brought to the village by someone from the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion by sea. To motivate the warriors, she promised them gold and riches if they could intercept it. The docks became crowded with these warriors, all eager to stop the messenger. However, when the expected ship finally arrived, the messenger was nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, in Xili village, Xiaoxi was enjoying a Red Crescent warrior opera. Unfortunately, the show was cut short due to rain. Seeking shelter, Xiaoxi decided to take a break at a local liquor store. Since the place was full, he ended up sharing a table with a man dressed in white. But when Xiaoxi put down a potted plant he was carrying on the table, the warriors in the tavern became suspicious. When they realized that he had come from the sea, they became aggressive. Fortunately, a female warrior named Wenro came to his aid. She's the sister of the Red Crescent Swordsman and also a princess, so people are cautious about crossing her. Once they were in a safe place, Wenro couldn't help but wonder why Xiaoxi hadn't used his sword to defend himself back at the liquor store. She was quite intrigued by the potted plant he had with him. Xiaoxi explained that he's careful about drawing his sword. Just then, Bai Chou Fei, the man Xiaoxi had shared the table with earlier, suddenly appeared. He was after the white jade box that Xiaoxi was carrying. Xiaoxi refused to give it to him, so Bai Chou Fei left. Shortly after, a man named Shui, Shishen, showed up. He was a friend of Xiao Xi's teacher and invited them to his place. At Shishen's house, as they enjoyed some wine, Shishen brought up the white jade box. He wanted Xiao Xi to hand it over, claiming that he was the right person to deliver it to Meng Zun in the capital. Since Shishen was a trusted friend of Xiao Xi's teacher, Xiao Xi agreed to give him the box. However, things took a surprising turn when Wenro, after chatting and drinking with Xi Shen, suddenly passed out. Xiao Xi realized that the wine had been spiked, but thankfully, he hadn't taken a sip. Feeling betrayed, he suspected that Xi Shen might hand over the box to their enemies during an upcoming event called the Sea Ceremony Parade. So, when Wenro woke up, he asked her to accompany him to the event. During the parade, Xiao Xi's suspicions were proven right. Lei Chun demanded the white jade box from Xi Shen. Poor Shi Shen didn't have much of a choice because Lei Chun had his family as hostages. To ensure their safety, he had to give up the box she wanted. In the evening, Xiao Shi and Wenro were both at the sea ceremony parade. As the event unfolded, many warriors were keeping a close eye to make sure everything went smoothly. Xiao Shi suggested that Wenro enjoy the parade while he blended into the crowd. Using his skills, he managed to figure out where Shi Shen had hidden the white jade box. When other warriors realized where the box was, chaos broke out. Xiao Shi signaled Chou Fei using a secret code they had agreed upon earlier. 
Just then, Lei Chun was approaching in her carriage. Cho Fei boldly blocked her path. Lei Chun tried to tempt him with a high position in the Lu Fenban sect to let her go, but Cho Fei wasn't swayed by it. Meanwhile, Xiao Shi found himself in a tough situation. He had successfully obtained the White Jade Box, but now he was surrounded by a group of warriors. Wenro tried to come to his rescue, but a swordsman named Tuba Yun captured her. Xiao Shi was faced with a difficult choice. He remembered his teacher's advice about not using his sword without a good reason, especially for rescues, as it would forever connect his destiny with the person he saved. However, after thinking it over, he drew his sword, defeated the warriors, and freed Wenro. The news of the Liu Finban sect warriors' defeat reached Lei Chun, and in response, she ordered the release of Shi Shen's family. A wounded Shi Shen met with Xiao Shi and Wenro, confessing that he had been forced to take the box and warning them that Lei Chun would never stop pursuing it. Filled with regret, Shi Shen made a heartbreaking decision. After all the chaos, Xiao Shi and Wenro met with Cho Fei to express their gratitude for his assistance. Out of curiosity, Cho Fei asked to see what was inside the white jade box. To everyone's surprise, when he opened it, the box was empty. The next day, Xiao Shi was busy burying Shi Shen, and Wenro couldn't help but wonder about the actual contents of the white jade box. Xiao Shi finally revealed that the real items were actually hidden in the potted plant he always carried with him. Later, they approached Cho Fei, who was relaxing at the beach, and proposed a partnership to protect the box and leave the troublesome Xili region behind. Cho Fei agreed to their proposal. Before they set off, he took them to his parents' graves and opened up, sharing his true name with his new allies. As they journeyed toward the capital, they came across an elderly man singing a song about a hero. Touched by the song, Wenro and Cho Fei expressed their desire to be remembered in such songs. The old man seemed to sense something special about them and asked for their names, hinting at their future heroism. Meanwhile, at the border of the Song State, Mun Zun and his men ambushed a group of passing soldiers in the forest. His loyal companion, Yang Wuxie, soon joined him. Mun Zun instructed Wuxie to retrieve the head of a specific general that the soldiers were carrying. During this, a mysterious figure shot an arrow with a letter attached. After reading it, Meng Zun received the unfortunate news of Shi Shen's death. Wu Xie speculated that Shi Shen's demise might be part of a larger plot by Hua Wu Chu to gain more power in the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Over at Kuling Pier, Lei Chun had made preparations to travel to the capital. When Xiao Shi, Wenro, and Cho Fei arrived at the pier with the same intention, they noticed that Lei Chun's ship had already set sail. Without wasting a moment, Xiao Shi, known for his musical talents, played his flute to signal the ship to return. To their surprise, the ship actually turned around and returned to the pier. When they boarded, they were greeted by a lady who introduced herself as Tian Chun. Although she was actually Lei Chun in disguise, none of the trio recognized her. Xiao Shi and Cho Fei took advantage of the peaceful moment to do some casual fishing from the ship. This shared experience strengthened their growing friendship even more. Somewhere else, a tense atmosphere hung over the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. A man clearly under pressure was brought before two people. Gu Dong, a well-known figure within the pavilion, and the more mysterious Wu Chuo. After being interrogated about Meng Zun's whereabouts and giving the information they wanted, Wu Chuo ordered the man to be executed. Gu Dong, who had become aware of Wu Chuo's plan to set a trap for Meng Zun, expressed his concerns. He knew that Meng Zun was a formidable opponent, and ambushing him wouldn't be an easy task. Later, in a reflective mood, Wu Chuo's thoughts went back in time. He remembered the day Su Zemu, the respected leader of the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion and Meng Zun's father, had discovered Wu Chuo's true loyalty. Originally placed there as a spy from the rival Liu Fenban sect, Wu Chuo was surprisingly spared from severe consequences by Zemu. Recognizing Wu Chuo's past contributions to the pavilion, Zemu offered him a chance to be genuinely loyal. However, despite this act of kindness, present-day Wu Chuo was harboring ambitions to take control of the pavilion, even if it meant sidelining Meng Zun to achieve his goals. Continuing from where we left off, 
The peaceful atmosphere on the ship was disrupted by Xiaoxi, Fei, and Wenro, who were having a lively drinking session. They laughed and shared stories until they got quite drunk and eventually passed out. Seizing this opportunity, Lei Chun and her bodyguard began searching through Xiaoxi's belongings in their quest to find the precious white jade box. The seriousness of the situation was emphasized by the bodyguard, who warned that if the Liu Fenban sect got hold of the box, it would bring disaster to the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. However, in a surprising turn of events, Lei Chun, possibly torn by inner conflict, ended up killing her own bodyguard and tossed his body into the river. Elsewhere, in a solemn setting, Meng Zun, along with Wu Xie, was conducting a funeral ceremony for their fallen general, showing the proper respect for the solemn occasion. As the sun rose, Xiao Xi and Chou Fei woke up with a sense of worry and quickly checked their belongings. They breathed a sigh of relief when they found that the white jade box was still safe and sound. However, Lei Chun's sudden departure from the ship the previous night left them puzzled. When they disembarked in the capital, the tension between Chou Fei and Wenro reached its breaking point, leading Wenro to decide to go her own way. Xiao Xi's reason for agreeing to this separation was to protect her from the upcoming dangers of their mission. Meanwhile, Meng Zun, anticipating a meeting with Xiao Xi, strategically positioned himself on a platform, making it easier for Xiao Xi to spot him. When they finally met, it was a friendly encounter, and Xiao Xi handed over a letter from Xiao Yi. This exchange marked the beginning of a new friendship between the two of them. At the same time, the Liu Finban sect's plan to eliminate Meng Zun was unfolding rapidly. Dai Fei Jing, a respected figure within the sect, was gathering his forces for the upcoming attack. Another high-ranking member, Du Zi, was also seen collaborating on this mission. Lei Chun's journey back to Xili was filled with revelations. She confided in her trusted friend, admitting that she had chosen not to steal the white jade box. Her decision was influenced by her father's breaking of a secret promise, which involved acquiring the box without harming anyone. The political and martial complexities of the situation deepened when Gu Dong and his troops approached Meng Zun in the capital. Under the guise of extending an olive branch and welcoming Meng Zun back to the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion, Gu Dong revealed his true intentions. He presented a list of traitors that he promised to eliminate and then unexpectedly launched an attack on Meng Zun. This led to a fierce confrontation, with Meng Zun's forces engaging in a heated battle against Gu Dong's troops. Duzi, who had previously been in the shadows, revealed herself and directly confronted the formidable Red Crescent Swordsman. Just when Gu Dong seemed to have the upper hand, a surprising intervention by Lei Hen and his army changed the course of the battle. Meng Zun was in a vulnerable position, but Xiao Xi and Chou Fei stepped forward and joined forces with the Red Crescent Swordsman. Their combined strength forced Lei Hen's forces to retreat. Meng Zun, grateful for Xiao Xi and Chou Fei's help, shared a grim truth about his declining health. His recent injuries had worsened an old illness, raising doubts about his ability to continue fighting. However, Xiao Xi, displaying unwavering determination, assured him of their support. Likewise, Chou Fei, despite his known hostility toward the Liu Fenban sect, pledged his commitment to Meng Zun's cause. Meanwhile, Wenro found herself at the Wu family inn, where she encountered Wu Xie. Xiao Xi had sent him to ensure her safety. Wu Xie filled her in on the recent developments, including Xiao Xi's and Chou Fei's alliance with Meng Zun against the Liu Fenban sect. Wenro was skeptical of this information and had doubts about Wu Xi's account of events. In another smart move, Meng Zun, along with Xiao Xi and Chou Fei, made their way to the gates of Poban. They were welcomed by Shi Wu Kui. Meng Zun saw promise in Wu Kui and hoped to make him a trusted ally in the upcoming showdown with the Liu Finban sect. However, their arrival had already caused some commotion within the sect, with Lei Mei, a high-ranking member, getting ready to oppose their progress. Meng Zun was getting ready for a crucial meeting with Fei Jing, the leader of a powerful group. Realizing the potential danger, he assigned specific tasks to his friends to ensure security. Xiao Xi was stationed at the main entrance, while Chou Fei kept an eye on the upper gate. 
There were other important figures present, including Lei Mei and the head of the punishment division, Fu Zhangshu. They noticed that Lei Hen was missing, suggesting that he had failed to capture Meng Zan earlier. As the meeting continued, tensions grew higher. Fei Jing boldly stated his intention to challenge Meng Zan directly. While both sides were getting ready for a confrontation, Xiao Xi encountered an unexpected challenge at his post, a mysterious warrior with significant inner strength. However, Xiao Xi's own strength prevailed, and the warrior retreated. This small victory boosted Meng Zun's position, allowing him to leave without a direct clash with Fei Jing. This turn of events left Fei Jing frustrated, and another leader, Lei Sun, had to step in to keep the peace. In a different part of the city, Zemu, who was recovering from a recent illness, was advised by his confidant Mo Bai Chen to take more time to rest and recover. However, Zemu felt ready to resume his duties and soon met with Wu Chuo, a figure rumored to have connections with the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Shortly after their meeting, Bai Chen received confidential information from Lai Lian Sin about Zemu's health, suggesting an urgent matter. Zemu and Wu Chuo had a friendly conversation, but Zemu couldn't help but warn Wu Chuo about the inherent dangers of pursuing Meng Zun. Things took a turn when news arrived about Meng Zun's impending return, prompting Wu Chuo to take the drastic step of imprisoning Zemu. While staying at the Wu family inn, Wenro was feeling quite upset. She found herself confined to a closet by Xiao Shi to prevent her from joining the group on their way to the Liu Finban Sex headquarters. Later that day, Meng Zun approached her, trying to ease the tension. He reminded her of her challenging past, particularly the family pressures she faced to get married. These pressures led her to choose the path of a wandering swordsman. In another part of the inn, Xiao Shi and Chou Fei found a quiet spot in the courtyard. They relaxed with some wine and talked about Meng Zun's impressive abilities and Xiao Shi's recent encounter with a mysterious warrior at the Popin Gate. That evening, there was an increased sense of security around Zemu's quarters. Guards sent by Wu Chuo surrounded the area. When Wu Chuo came to visit, Lian Sin was on high alert and ready to confront him. However, Zemu stepped in, advising Wu Chuo that taking on Meng Zun would not be a wise decision. Offended by Zemu's confidence in Meng Zun, Wu Chuo responded with a threat, indicating his intentions to harm Zemu's son. The next morning, there was a sense of unity among them. Meng Zun organized a small get-together with Xiao Shi and their friends as a way to show gratitude for their help. Their conversation turned to Meng Zun's upcoming journey to the capital. Xiao Shi came up with a clever plan. He would disguise himself as Meng Zun to divert the attention of potential spies. To make this plan more convincing, Wen Ro and Wu Xie would go with fake Meng Zun. Meanwhile, Chou Fei would accompany the real Meng Zun to ensure his safety. After everyone agreed to this plan, they started getting ready. At the same time, Meng Zun and Wu Xie discussed an unopened letter from Xiao Shi. Although Wu Xie thought the letter might contain important information, Meng Zun decided to put it aside. Instead, he asked Wu Xie to spread the news about his upcoming arrival in the capital. Later, Xiao Shi, dressed as the Red Crescent Swordsman, set off for the capital with Wenro and Wu Shui. Meanwhile, Meng Zun and Chou Fei took a different path, heading to Xili Village for a special meeting. Once they reached the capital, Xiao Shi and his group made sure to stand out to create the illusion that Meng Zun had arrived, hoping that eager spies would notice and spread the word. Meanwhile, in another place, two swordsmen named Lai Nian Tang and Long Xiao King were deeply engrossed in a conversation about Wu Chuo's ambitions. They had doubts about his ability to lead the pavilion. Their discussion was suddenly interrupted when an arrow, with a letter attached, landed on their table. Nian Tang quickly read the message, which called for both him and Xiao King to meet Meng Zun at the Jinxin Pavilion. Back in Xili Village, Meng Zun and Chou Fei finally reached their destination. There, Meng Zun was reunited with Lei Chun, his former love. During their heartfelt conversation, Lei Chun expressed her relief that Meng Zun had trustworthy allies on his side. When he asked for her opinion on Xiao Shi and Chou Fei, Lei Chun acknowledged their swordsmanship skills. However, she pointed out that Wenro's influence would be crucial in determining their true loyalties. 
While all of this was happening inside, Cho Fei remained vigilant outside, ensuring the safety of the meeting and patiently waiting for it to end. In the bustling capital, Xiao Shi and his friends found an inn to rest. As Xiao Shi was getting ready to relax, he felt a bit embarrassed when he noticed a hole in one of his socks. Sensing his discomfort, Wenro tactfully left the room to give him some privacy. Meanwhile, Meng Zun wrapped up his heartfelt conversation with Lei Chun. It was a somber moment as they said their goodbyes, realizing that the upcoming battles between their sects might prevent them from meeting again. Back at the inn, Wenro spent her evening knitting a fresh pair of socks, planning to give them to Xiao Shi. The next morning, she found Xiao Shi standing by a closed window, lost in thought. When she asked him what he was doing, he explained that he could sense the vibes of the capital through his keen hearing. The city's energy was quite different from the tranquility of his home in Beishu Park. Wenro gave him the socks she had made the night before, and they started discussing his disguise as Mum Zun. Xiao Shi seemed confident in his ability to impersonate him. When she tried to open a window for some fresh air, Xiao Shi quickly stopped her, emphasizing the need for privacy in case of potential spies. Their sudden closeness led to an awkward and flustered moment between them. Somewhere else, Wu Chuo's trusted aide, Lu Jansan, had a meeting with him to discuss their strategy against Meng Zun. Wu Chuo emphasized how important it was to succeed this time and told Jan San to gather their troops. They were getting ready for a showdown with Meng Zun in the capital. Inside the inn, Xiao Shi mentally prepared himself for the upcoming confrontation. His mind went back to the time when Meng Zun had entrusted him with his sword and taught him his unique fighting style. All of this was to make sure that Xiao Shi's impersonation would be perfect. Meanwhile, Meng Zun and Chou Fei arrived at the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Chou Fei took the lead, planning to clear the path so that Meng Zun could enter without getting involved in any fights. This was crucial because Meng Zun had a meeting with his father inside the pavilion. At the Jixian Pavilion, where Xiao Shi was staying, things were getting intense. Wu Chuo and his men arrived and had a conversation with Nian Tang, suggesting that he should choose a side in the upcoming conflict. Just as Xiao Qin attempted to enter Xiao Shi's quarters, Wenro, determined to protect Xiao Shi's identity, splashed water on Xiao King's face, telling him to step back. Recognizing her as the Wan family's daughter, Xiao King decided it was better to let it go, even though he was clearly annoyed. The time for action had arrived. Both Xiao Shi and Meng Zun lit incense sticks, signaling the start of their plans. Chou Fei jumped into action, taking on the guards at the pavilion to create an opening for Meng Zun. At the same time, Xiao Shi, still hidden behind curtains, began negotiations with the pavilion's leaders, including Wu Chuo. Meanwhile, Wenro cleverly delayed the meeting, making sure that the pavilion's leaders couldn't leave for their headquarters just yet. In the heart of the pavilion, there was an emotional reunion between Meng Zun and his ailing father, Zemu. Meng Zun gave his father a bottle of wine, and a letter that exposed Wu Chuo's deceitful activities, confirming Wu Chuo's betrayal within the pavilion. Understanding the seriousness of the situation, Zimu passed on the pavilion's leadership ring to his son, indicating a shift in power. This gesture showed both Meng Zun's capability and his father's trust in him. As they shared a heartful drink, Zimu's life came to an end. Meanwhile, tension was rising at the Jixian pavilion. Xiao Shi was trying to prove that he was Meng Zun by demonstrating some moves taught by the Red Crescent Swordsman. However, his efforts were in vain. An alarm went off, alerting Wu Chuo and the pavilion leaders to potential danger and accidentally revealing Xiao Shi's true identity. Thinking quickly, Xiao Shi informed the assembly that Meng Zun had taken control of the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Rushing to the pavilion hall, Wu Chuo saw Meng Zun, who was the rightful leader of the pavilion. Realizing that further resistance was pointless, Wu Chuo admitted defeat. In a generous gesture, echoing his father's values, Meng Zun showed mercy to Wu Chuo. However, forgiving didn't mean forgetting the wrongdoing. In a big meeting with all the pavilion leaders and warriors present, Meng Zun officially expelled Wu Chuo from the pavilion, condemning him for his betrayal in favor of the Lufenban sect. 
This gathering was a significant moment, as Munzun solidified his position as the pavilion's main leader, marking the beginning of a new era for the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. After all the significant changes in the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion and the Lufenban sect, everything was different. Jan San's meeting with Lei Sun was the final step in condemning Wu Chuo as a traitor to the sect. Zimu's death had a profound impact, with the pavilion's bell ringing to honor his memory and Lei Chun grieving deeply. But amid the sorrow, Mengzun's worsening health became apparent, adding to the challenges facing the pavilion's leadership. Lei Sun, on the other hand, was pleased that his longtime rival, Zimu, was no longer a threat. However, his dark side was revealed when he was found holding someone captive in a well. To make things even more complex, Lei Sun tried to break the growing bond between Lei Chun and Meng Zun by ordering her to assassinate the newly appointed pavilion leader. On the rooftops that night, Xiao Shi, Wenro, and Chou Fei shared their dreams of becoming famous warriors, creating a peaceful moment. However, the tranquility didn't last long. Wu Chuo, who had fallen from grace, crossed paths with Xiao Shi, hinting at his desire to leave the world of warriors behind. But fate had other ideas. Wu Chuo's departure was violently interrupted by Jian San, a bitter former subordinate. Xiao Shi stepped in to prevent further violence but couldn't save Wu Chuo from death. In his final moments, Wu Chuo gave Xiao Shi a cryptic warning, advising him to stay away from the capital, suggesting that there were larger conspiracies at play. After Zemu's funeral, the relationships and dynamics within the pavilion were changing. Lian Xin's decision to leave was a poignant one. Her bond with Meng Zun had deepened over shared experiences, and her father had cared for Meng Zun during his younger years. Their parting highlighted Meng Zun's fragile health, a matter of great concern to him and his close ally, Chou Fei. In the city, tension simmered between the two main factions, the Lufenban sect and the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Xiao Shi experienced this firsthand as he walked the city streets with Chou Fei and Wenro. A reckless wagon incident revealed the power balance and unspoken rules between these groups. Chou Fei's desire to intervene and Wenro's caution showed how even simple actions could have big political consequences. The events after the cart entered Liu Fenban sect territory exposed the sect's dark side. When the merchant introduced Fei Jing to the bodyguard Lei Chun had targeted, it revealed a complex web of betrayals and loyalties. The Liu Fenban sect wasn't just about power and politics, it was a place where loyalties were tested and failure led to severe consequences. Fei Jing's reaction to the bodyguard's survival, branding him a traitor and punishing him harshly, highlighted the sect's ruthlessness and strict code of conduct. The city's politics weren't just about territory, they also involved personal vendettas, loyalties, and the constant threat of death. Xiao Shi and his friends had plans to eat at a restaurant, but Chou Fei said he had something to do and asked them to go ahead. However, Chou Fei surprised them by going to gamble instead, trying to predict his future with a coin toss. While he was deep in the game, Wenro and Xiao Shi came running, being chased by a group from a nearby tavern. Chou Fei stepped in and scared the chasers away. To avoid further trouble, Wenro and Xiao Shi decided to go in different directions. As Xiao Shi tried to find a place to hide, he accidentally ended up in a brothel where he met Zhu Xiao Yao. He wanted to leave right away, but Xiao Yao was worried that his sudden exit might make her establishment look bad. So, out of politeness, Xiao Shi stayed to talk. Their conversation took an unexpected turn when Xiao Yao offered him some wine. After drinking it, he passed out. While Xiao Shi was regaining his senses, Wen Ro and Chou Fei were frantically searching for him in town. When he woke up, Xiao Yao teased him, joking that they had a romantic night together and even suggesting they should get married. Panicked, Xiao Shi tried to make a quick exit through a window. But his plan didn't go well, as he ended up falling right in front of Wenro and Chou Fei. They saw him coming out of a brothel, and Wenro, frustrated and upset, walked away while Xiao Shi struggled to explain himself. Xiao Yao, from a distance, watched the whole thing, finding Xiao Shi's misadventures rather amusing. Meanwhile, Chou Fei finally caught up with Xiao Shi, 
and wanted to show him the coin he had bet earlier to see if he won. However, before they could do that, a high-ranking government official named Fu Zong Shu arrived with his guards and arrested them. Both young men were confused about why they were being taken into custody, and Zong Shu didn't offer any explanations. They were thrown into a cell that seemed to have recently held another prisoner who had been severely punished by Ren Lao, known for his brutal methods of extracting confessions. Meanwhile, Wen Ro, unaware of her friend's situation, impatiently waited for them at a local tavern. Inside the cell, Xiao Shi and Chou Fei suspected that their arrest might be linked to the notorious Liu Finban sect. Chou Fei cautioned them to be careful, especially around Zong Shu. Their conversation was cut short when a guard arrived to take Xiao Shi for questioning. Ren Lao, determined to extract a confession, accused Xiao Shi of causing trouble in the city involving a jade box. Despite Xiao Shi's denials, Ren Lao subjected him to a painful method of stretching his arms. Then, it was Chou Fei's turn to face interrogation. Zhang Shu wanted to know why Chou Fei had helped Meng Zun before. Chou Fei tried to explain, but he too endured a brutal interrogation method, nearly drowning. After these intense sessions, Zhang Shu ordered Ren Lao not to kill the two young men. It seemed he had plans to manipulate them into serving him. The next day, Wen Ro decided to visit the brothel, thinking Xiao Yao might know where Xiao Shi was. When she entered Xiao Yao's room, she became upset and accused her of hiding Xiao Shi. Her frustration led to her breaking some items in the room, which prompted the brothel guards to intervene. Just then, Wu Xie arrived after hearing about Wen Ro's actions. He apologized to Xiao Yao and convinced Wen Ro to leave with him. He assured her that both he and Meng Zun would help in the search for the missing Xiao Shi and Chou Fei. Soon after, Ren Lao paid a visit to the Jinfun Rain Pavilion, where Meng Zun and his comrades were mourning. Despite the sorrowful atmosphere, Ren Lao brought firecrackers and conveyed Zong Shu's orders to set them off. When Meng Zun hesitated, Ren Lao threatened the lives of Xiao Shi and Chou Fei, who were imprisoned. To ensure their safety, Meng Zun reluctantly ordered his men to light the firecrackers. Upon learning that her friends were in custody, Wenro approached Wu Xie, urging him to rescue them. However, he advised caution and discouraged hasty actions against the authorities. Ignoring his counsel, Wenro took matters into her own hands. She ignited fireworks on a road that Zhang Shu was expected to pass through. Her bold act resulted in her arrest. Surprisingly, instead of punishing her, Zhang Shu allowed Wenro to join her friends in jail. Wenro arrived at the prison gate with fireworks, determined to free Xiao Shi and Chou Fei. Inside their cell, the two friends grappled with hunger as the jailers provided them with only raw meat. However, the distant sound of fireworks offered them a glimmer of hope for a potential rescue. The following day, Meng Zun took it upon himself to negotiate with Zhang Shu for their release. Zhang Shu presented his terms. Xiao Shi and Chou Fei would not be allowed to return to the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion, and in exchange for their freedom, Meng Zun would have to carry out an assignment for him. Feeling trapped and wanting to save his friends, Meng Zun reluctantly accepted the conditions. Following the tense negotiation, Meng Zun's health appeared to worsen. He confided in Wu Xi about his assignment. He had to travel to the western region and target an official named Liu and Shi, as demanded by Zhang Shu. Meng Zun also entrusted Wu Xie with the safety of Xiao Shi and Chou Fei. In the jail, Chou Fei was on the verge of giving in to hunger and eating the raw meat, but Xiao Shi stopped him. A sudden rain shower reminded them of their dreams of becoming warriors. Before they knew it, they were released from prison, facing Fei Jing, who invited them to join the Liu Finban sect, since they couldn't return to the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. However, they declined, even when offered prestigious positions within the sect. Afterward, Chou Fei and Xiao Shi attempted to find jobs in the city, but every employer turned them away. Local businesses were afraid of getting into trouble with the Liu Finban sect. Meanwhile, back at the sect, Lei Mei questioned Fei Jing about his decision not to eliminate Xiao Shi and Chou Fei. He explained that taking such action might provoke a conflict between their sect and the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Lei Mei expressed her concerns to Lei Soon, but he supported Fei Jing's approach. At a marketplace, 
Wenro tried to help Xiaoxi and Fei by having someone intentionally drop money near them. However, Xiaoxi quickly returned the money. Watching from a distance, Mu Xie told Wenro that this trick wouldn't work and encouraged her to come up with a new plan. While Cho Fei felt frustrated with Xiao Xi for returning the money they found, especially since they were hungry, an unexpected opportunity arose. A blind elderly lady named Xia Hua, who turned out to be Wenro's maid, approached them and asked for their help in baking bread. She even offered them a place to stay. Grateful for the offer, they followed her to her home and settled into a room she provided. As they relaxed, Cho Fei and Xiao Xi discussed the difficulties they faced in the capital. Xiao Xi opened up about his painful past, including the loss of his mother in the city. Through their shared challenges, they made a pact to confront everything together. That same night, a threat emerged. Lei Sun sneaked into Xia Hua's home with the intention of harming the two friends. However, Master Wu Fuzi, sent by the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion, intervened and forced Lei Sun to retreat. Meanwhile, Xiao Xi, unable to sleep, ventured outside to meditate and reminisced about his memories with Xiao Yi at Beishu Park. As he finished his meditation and returned, he was surprised to find Fu Zi, Xia Hua's husband, standing before him. With the morning sun heralding new beginnings, Xiao Xi took Fu Zi's advice to heart and secured a job at a drugstore, thanks to his organizational skills and neat handwriting. Cho Fei, known for his artistic talent, found employment at a calligraphy and painting shop. Their workdays concluded with hearty dinners at Fuzi's home. One evening, Meng Zun paid a visit to Fuzi's place, where they engaged in deep conversations about the enigmatic Yucho group. Meng Zun was convinced that this group played a role in the unrest in the region. Cho Fei's artistic talent began to gain recognition. An impressed customer suggested that Cho Fei create more mainstream art that would appeal to a wider audience. They made a deal. The man would sell Cho Fei's paintings, and they would share the profits. At the drugstore, Xiao Shi spent his days cataloging medicines with his precise handwriting. However, one day, things got interesting when Xiao Yao walked in and specifically requested his service. As he helped her, she made ambiguous comments that made the store owner think there might be a romantic history between them. Meanwhile, over at the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion, Wenro tried to make a sneaky escape. She concocted a fake letter from her father, hoping to convince Wu Xie that she needed to return home. However, Wu Xie saw through her ruse and put a stop to her plans. A few days later, Cho Fei's foray into the world of art didn't go as planned. The man who initially showed interest in Cho Fei's artwork couldn't grasp the deeper meaning of his recent pieces. Sadly, the shop owner confirmed that none of Cho Fei's paintings had been sold. It appeared that the art world was proving to be as challenging as their previous adventures. Xiao Xi's situation took a dire turn when a fire engulfed the drugstore where he worked. As the flames consumed his workplace, Xiao Xi's hopes were dashed. He had lost another source of income. That evening, as he meditated to gather his thoughts and find solace, Cho Fei expressed concerns about the cold weather and suggested that Xiao Xi wear warmer clothes during his nighttime meditations. While Cho Fei suspected that the fire might have been caused by the Lu Fen Ban sect, Xiao Xi attributed the incident to his unlucky fate. Wenro's restless spirit still longed for a way out of the pavilion's confines. During one of her secret outings, she met the storyteller again and shared the challenges she and her friends had faced. Later, she had an unexpected encounter with Lei Chun. They talked, and Wenro suggested that Lei Chun should recruit Xiao Xi and Cho Fei into the Lufen Bon sect. However, Lei Chun noticed that the two young men seemed disillusioned with the world of martial arts. As they continued their stroll, they came across the art shop displaying Cho Fei's paintings. Lei Chun admired one particular piece. When he inquired about the artist, the seller explained Cho Fei's humble background. However, much to Cho Fei's disappointment, Lei Chun decided not to buy the artwork right away, even though he was intrigued by it. Meanwhile, Xiao Xi's situation was getting worse. He had to resort to a risky game where he dodged thrown stones for money. This dangerous activity attracted some shady characters. Jan San, a notorious figure, had been watching Xiao Xi from the shadows. 
He saw a chance to get rid of the young warrior and ordered his men to join the game, replacing stones with arrows. Xiao Shi, in a display of both bravery and desperation, agreed to this life-threatening challenge. It was Chou Fei who intervened just in time to stop this dangerous game. Although he saved his friend, Chou Fei couldn't hide his disappointment. He scolded Xiao Shi for risking his life for a small amount of money. But Xiao Shi, frustrated, explained that it was the only way for him to survive in the tough city. Later that evening, with his challenges mounting, Xiao Shi considered seeking help from the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. He stood in front of its impressive gates, torn between his pride and the urgency of his situation. But before he could gather the courage to knock, doubt took over and he decided against it. However, his moment of relief was short-lived. Jan San and his gang of thugs had been lying in wait, thinking they had a perfect chance to ambush Xiao Shi as he left the pavilion. However, they underestimated Xiao Shi's martial skills and his heightened awareness. In a whirlwind of action, Xiao Shi took on the attackers, defeating them with his agility, strength, and techniques. The streets, which were filled with the sounds of the battle just moments ago, fell silent as Xiao Shi stood among his defeated foes. He let out a frustrated roar, and Jian San lay defeated at his feet. At the same time, Lei Mei took Chou Fei to a fancy bar in the city. She shared her perspective, emphasizing that martial arts skills alone might not be enough for a meaningful life in the bustling capital. She pointed out that many talented warriors ended up performing on the streets just to make a living. This made Chou Fei deeply reflect on his situation, and he silently decided to leave the city, keeping his intentions hidden from Xiao Shi. In another part of the city, Lei Chun was deep in her thoughts and prayers, wishing for Meng Zun's safe return from his journey. She eventually received news that Meng Zun had indeed come back safely from his expedition to the west. Upon returning, Meng Zun paid a visit to Zhang Xu's residence. He handed Zhang Xu a box, and to Zhang Xu's surprise, it contained the head of someone related to his shady dealings, but not the exact person he had expected. This enraged Zhang Xu, and he threatened Meng Zun. However, Meng Zun had some powerful information about Song Shu's secrets, which he used to ensure his own safety. As the next day dawned, Xiao Shi learned about Chou Fei's decision to journey alone, but he was determined to accompany his friend. At the same time, in the pavilion, Meng Zun had a meeting with Wu Xie. They discussed the illicit activities led by Zong Shu and his connections to the Lu Finban sect in the state of Liang. Meng Zun had hoped to get more information from En Shi, but just when it seemed En Shi might reveal crucial details, he was mysteriously killed. Upon learning about this development, Wu Xie also found out about Xiao Shi and Chou Fei's plan to leave the capital. At the edge of the city, Wen Ro was clearly annoyed. She was mad that Xiao Shi and Chou Fei hadn't told her they were leaving. In her usual way, she directed them to a place where Meng Zun was waiting, a spot for swordsmen. When they arrived, Meng Zun warmly greeted them, saying he saw them as brothers. To strengthen this bond, he suggested they take a traditional vow of brotherhood. They'd agreed, and after a heartfelt ceremony, they decided not to leave the city after all. Instead, they chose to stay with Meng Zun and went to the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Inside the pavilion, Meng Zun was a friendly host. He gave them a tour and introduced them to other members. He even went the extra mile and offered Chou Fei an important role as his representative. This position came with perks, like a room stocked with fancy drinks. Later, at a formal event, Meng Zun officially welcomed Chou Fei and Xiao Shi to the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Another member named Wu Xia spoke about them. When introducing Xiao Shi, Wu Xia playfully hinted at his supposed first love, making Wenro jealous. However, after the event, Wu Xia clarified to Wenro that the story about Xiao Shi's romantic past was just a joke. On another front, Lei Sun and Fei Jing received an invitation to visit Zhang Shu's home. Zhang Shu was worried that Meng Zun might expose his illegal activities to the authorities. Fei Jing, trying to reassure him, claimed that Meng Zun had no knowledge of those shady dealings. Feeling trapped and defiant, Zhang Shu asked Lei Sun and Fei Jing to handle Meng Zun, whom he believed was going too far. At the Lufenban sect, 
Lei Chun played her lute and heard about Xiao Shi and Chou Fei joining the Jin Feng Rain Pavilion. She thought it might be nice to have a meal with them. However, Fei Jing had different ideas. He met with Xiao Qin and attempted to create conflict by turning the pavilion leaders against Chou Fei, who had recently risen in rank. But Xiao Qin saw through Fei Jing's scheme. Feeling cornered, Fei Jing threatened Xiao Qin with evidence of past dealings with a man named Wu Chuo, forcing him to cooperate. In the evening, Xiao Shi and his friends had a delicious meal courtesy of Lei Chun. They shared stories and experiences over dinner. As they left the restaurant, Lei Chun realized she had dropped her hairpin. When she returned to retrieve it, she found Chou Fei waiting for her, and he returned the lost item. Chou Fei took the opportunity to play a sweet melody on his flute, serenading the girl he had feelings for. Meanwhile, Lei Chong, an important figure from the Liufenban sect, teamed up with Lei Sun to gather a group of soldiers who were involved in their illegal activities. However, Lei Sun tricked them. He coerced these soldiers into undertaking a dangerous mission by threatening to harm their families if they refused. After they complied and met a tragic end, Lei Sun showed no mercy. He instructed Lei Chong to eliminate the soldiers' families as well. Elsewhere, Zhang Shu anxiously awaited updates in his home, while outside, the usually bustling streets were strangely quiet, catching Nian Tang's attention as he noticed the absence of the usual guard patrols. In the pavilion, Xiao King expressed his displeasure about Xiao Fei's new position to other pavilion officials. However, this meeting wasn't just for venting frustrations. Xiao King had darker intentions. He plotted to eliminate some of the pavilion's top leaders. After successfully carrying out his sinister plan, he proudly showed his actions to Fei Jing. With newfound ambition, Xiao King proposed targeting the leaders of the Liu Fenban sect next, believing his friend Nian Tang would join the cause. To his surprise, Nian Tang had switched sides, and instead of assistance, Xiao King found himself betrayed and captured by Fei Jing. At Zhang Shu's place, he received updates about recent actions by the Liu Fenban sect and prepared Ren Lao for what lay ahead. The Jin Feng Rain Pavilion was in chaos due to Fei Jing and his gang's disruption. This chaos revealed the shocking news of Xiao King's capture by the sect and Nian Tang's treachery. While Chou Fei was eager to confront Fei Jing, Mun Zun had a different plan. He saw potential in Fei Jing and believed that the two groups could merge for mutual benefit. Mun Zun tasked Xiao Shi with rescuing Xiao King, while he himself would save those who possessed knowledge of the corrupt dealings between the sect and Zhang Shu. In another location, Xiao King was enduring torture as Lei Hen pressed her for information about the pavilion, but she remained steadfast and didn't reveal anything. Meanwhile, as Xiao Shi and Chou Fei infiltrated the sect, Xiao Shi headed straight for the area where Xiao Qin was supposed to be held. He was drawn in by the enchanting melodies played by Xiao Yao on her traditional instrument. However, as soon as Lei Hen sensed Xiao Shi's presence, he strategically retreated, luring him further inside. To Xiao Shi's surprise, he found that the person in the room wasn't Xiao Qin. Realizing he had been deceived by Lei Hen, Xiao Shi prepared for a duel against two opponents. Fortunately, Xiao Yao intervened, dealing with the imposter and allowing Xiao Shi to focus on Lei Hen. In another chamber, Nian Tang was enjoying his newfound status within the Liu Fenban sect. His celebration was abruptly interrupted when Chou Fei burst in, taking on Nian Tang's guards. Unbeknownst to Chou Fei, Nian Tang had set a trap, and he fell into it. Just when things seemed dire for Chou Fei, an enigmatic swordsman suddenly entered the fray, coming to his aid. Elsewhere, after defeating Lei Hen, Xiao Shi found himself locked in a room. Desperate to escape, he called out to Xiao Yao for help. However, instead of assisting him, she jokingly suggested they spend the night together in the room. Xiao Shi, not amused by her playful attitude, thought she was acting strangely. Amidst the chaos, Lei Chong was relentlessly pursuing Long Ba, a young man who knew about the sect's illegal activities. As things appeared grim for Long Ba, Meng Zun appeared and ensured the young man's safety, rescuing him from danger. Later, Zhou Fei and Xiao Shi, along with Xiao Qin, reunited with Meng Zun. However, their joy was short-lived. 
As dawn approached, they were suddenly ambushed by Fei Jing and Zhang Shu. Just as the skirmish was escalating, the forces from the Law Division stepped in, putting an end to the battle as the first light of day broke. In a subsequent meeting, Meng Zun revealed to Chou Fei and Xiao Shi that Zhang Shu had connections with the Yukio Criminal Syndicate. This revelation explained why Meng Zun was so protective of Long Ba, even though the young man was visibly distressed due to the traumatic loss of his family. Later that evening, Xiao Shi approached Xiao Yao, hoping to have an honest conversation about the night they spent together. However, to his frustration, Xiao Yao continued to make jokes and playfully avoided his questions. Eventually, she left him alone after he had some wine. To Xiao Shi's surprise, Wenro was nearby and had witnessed their interaction. She admitted that she knew about Xiao Yao's harmless pranks on Xiao Shi. Feeling the need to explain himself, Xiao Shi shared the story of his sword and how it connected him to Wenro because he had once used it to help her. Meanwhile, Chou Fei wandered through the town and came across a painting shop owner who informed him that his artwork had been sold. The owner was thrilled and requested more paintings from Chou Fei, who happily agreed to create additional pieces. In a different part of the story, Mun Zun confronted Lei Sun, wanting to know why the Liu Fenban sect had become so aggressive. Lei Sun didn't hold back, explaining that their attack was a response to Chou Fei and Xiao Shi teaming up with the Jinfan Rain Pavilion and Meng Zun's increasing interference in the sex affairs. Despite the threats, Meng Zun remained determined to dig deeper into the sex's illegal activities. The next day, Lei Chun bought one of Chou Fei's paintings, planning to give it as a gift to Meng Zun. Meanwhile, Xiao Shi asked Wenro to join him at a high point in the city where they could enjoy a beautiful view. While they gazed out at the scenery, there was a noticeable tension between them, hinting at a growing attraction. Later in the evening, Lei Chun gave the painting she had bought to Meng Zun as a gift. In return, Meng Zun had a jade necklace ready for her. They had a long chat and said their goodbyes, with Meng Zun thinking it might be their last meeting because he planned to confront her father. Meanwhile, Xiao Shi and Wenro continued their walk through the city. As they crossed a bridge, they came across a young man named Fang Yin Khan, who pretended to be drowning in the river. Xiao Shi rushed to help, only to find out that it was a prank by Yin Khan. He even pretended that Wen Ro was his wife, which annoyed her greatly. Eventually, Yin Khan let them go after secretly stealing Wen Ro's money back. The next day, at the Liu Finban sect, Lei Sun was frustrated again as Lei Mei defeated him in a traditional chess game. During their conversation, Lei Mei expressed her desire to oversee affairs in the northern region, an area known for the sect's illegal activities. Lei Sun strongly disagreed, thinking it would harm the sect's interests. Later, as Lei Mei was about to deliver a letter from Lei Sun to the Pilla sect, she met Fei Jing, who subtly hinted that she was favored too much by Lei Sun. Lei Mei reached a tavern in the Pilla sect's territory, where she ran into Shou Fei, who was enjoying some wine. Lei Mei mentioned Chou Fei's impressive journey from being a wanderer to becoming a deputy pavilion leader. Chou Fei, however, believed his success was due to more than just luck. Their conversation was cut short when Lei Sun's carriage arrived, prompting Lei Mei to quickly leave and return to her sect. On a different note, Lei Chun visited her mother's grave with Fei Jing to remember the anniversary of her mother's passing. She expressed her disappointment with Lei Sun for seemingly forgetting about her mother. Meanwhile, Lei Sun was seen drinking to honor his deceased wife's memory. Surprisingly, he invited Guan Qi, a man he had once imprisoned in a well, to join him for a drink. Guan Qi was also the older brother of Lei Chun's mother and suspected that his younger sister had met a tragic end at the hands of Lei Sun. Meanwhile, Ying Khan wanted to meet his father, but Yuan Shan stopped him. As a result, Ying Khan decided to leave. Shortly after, he sent a letter to Wenro, offering to return her money in exchange for a meeting. Xiao Shi, aware of this, volunteered to meet Ying Khan instead. When they reached the agreed-upon location, Ying Khan played a trick on Xiao Shi by tossing the money back into a well, forcing Xiao Shi to enter the well where Guan Qi was imprisoned. After successfully getting inside the well, Guan Qi informed Lei Sun about his captivity and asked Xiao Shi to release him. 
Just as Xiao Shi was about to free Guan Qi, the prison walls started releasing water, flooding the area. Xiao Shi quickly unchained Guan Qi, and they managed to escape from the well. Lei Sun, upon learning that Guan Qi had escaped, ordered his men to search for the captive. Meanwhile, Yin Khan was relaxed because he had intentionally helped Guan Qi escape, hoping to expose the Yuchou crime group. Xiao Shi took Guan Qi to a shop, and Guan Qi confided in him that he had no more family or friends. Later, Fei Jing and his men saw Guan Qi with Xiao Shi, but didn't think it was connected to the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. However, even after Lei Sun got this information, he still suspected Mun Zun's involvement in the escape. After eating, Xiao Shi brought Guan Qi to the home of Guan Qi's friend, Yan Hifa, near the forest. Hifa was shocked to see Guan Qi, and things turned violent when Guan Qi, driven by revenge, killed Hifa's son and wife. Xiao Shi tried to intervene, but Guan Qi was too strong, and he easily knocked Xiao Shi out. Lei Su met with Zhang Shu to tell him about Guan Qi's escape from the well prison, which worried Zhang Shu. Xiao Shi and He Fa woke up with chains around their arms and necks, and Guan Qi appeared, bragging about his martial skills and how Lei Sun had once needed 100 warriors and swordsmen to capture him. Meng Zun also heard about Guan Qi's release and wanted to recruit him because of his exceptional martial arts skills. Meanwhile, Law Division troops arrived at the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Chou Fei explained that Xiao Shi had nothing to do with Guan Qi's escape and didn't know where his friend was. Despite the explanation, they arrested Chou Fei to question him further at the Lufenban sect. Deep in the forest, Jinfeng Rain Pavilion troops finally found Xiao Shi, who was with He Fa and under Guan Qi's control. They were on their way to where He Fa had hidden Guan Qi's weapon. After retrieving it, He Fa tried to fight Guan Qi, but was killed by his old friend. The Jinfeng Rain Pavilion's troops revealed themselves to rescue Xiao Shi. He tried to warn them about Guan Qi, but they didn't listen, and Guan Qi defeated them all with a single attack. Furious, Xiao Shi vowed to take matters into his own hands and defeat Guan Qi. Back in the Lufenban sect, Zhou Fei strongly denied any connection between his pavilion and Guan Qi's escape. But Lei Sun wasn't convinced and prepared to execute Zhou Fei. Thankfully, Lei Chun stepped in and revealed her true identity as the sect leader's daughter. Fei Jing pointed out that killing Chou Fei would hinder cooperation between the Lufenban sect and the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion in capturing Guan Qi. While waiting anxiously for Xiao Shi's return, Wenro decided to visit Ying Khan's place to ask about her missing friend. Ying Khan offered information about Xiao Shi's whereabouts in exchange for her compliance. Grateful for their help, Chou Fei thanked Lei Chun and Fei Jing for saving him. After Chou Fei left, Fei Jing talked to Lei Sun, the sect leader, about the timing of dealing with Chou Fei, suggesting that it wasn't the right moment. Meanwhile, Ying Khan invited Wenro to watch a sumo match and even challenged her to participate. Although initially overwhelmed by her opponent, Wenro's determination to find Xiao Shi drove her to victory. At the same time, Guan Qi went to Zhang Shu's place carrying a chest. He threw it at the gate, and when soldiers opened it, Xiao Shi popped out, holding a lit bomb. He urgently asked the soldiers to put out the bomb's fuse with water. Zhang Shu, who knew Guan Qi had arrived, tried to escape from the powerful warrior. Guan Qi chased after him, defeating any soldiers in his way. He finally caught up with Zhang Shu, ready to strike, but Xiao Shi stepped in, leading to a showdown that left Xiao Shi unconscious. Later in the evening, a tired Xiao Shi, still recovering, tried to walk to the pavilion but stumbled on the way. Wenro saw him and rushed to help, carrying him to ensure they reached the pavilion safely. Meanwhile, Zhang Shu sought refuge within the Lufenban sect after narrowly escaping Guan Qi. The next day, Fu Zi seemed to be getting ready for a fight as he carefully cleaned his spear. Cha Hua, worried, asked her husband to think twice about his plans. Inside the pavilion, Xiao Shi, now awake, asked Wenro about the scar on her face. She explained that she got it during the sumo match with Ying Khan. Then, Xiao Shi gave Wenro back her money bag and a necklace he had purchased for her earlier, making her very happy. They hummed, and just then, 
Cho Fei, and Meng Zun showed up, wanting to know how Xiao Shi was doing. Shortly after that, Ying Khan arrived at the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion to confess that he played a part in trapping Xiao Shi to free Guan Qi. He told them about his adoptive father, Fan Gugin, also known as the Blood Sword, who was hated by the Yukou group. Ying Khan's goal was to lure the group out of hiding by releasing Guan Qi. He suggested working together with the pavilion, but Cho Fei asked what the pavilion would gain from such an alliance. Meng Zun couldn't give an immediate answer, so Ying Khan said goodbye. After Ying Khan left, Meng Zun scolded Cho Fei for his profit-focused thinking, emphasizing that their pavilion stood for the values of honorable swordsmen and would continue its mission to fight crime. Meanwhile, Xiao Shi went to Fu Zi for information about Guan Qi. Fu Zi explained that Guan Qi was the ruthless leader of the Mitian Guild and expressed surprise that such a formidable warrior was still alive. Fu Zi had readied his spear to confront Guan Qi, but suggested that the younger generation handle the issue. In the Liufenban sect, Meng Zun and Lei Sun met with Zhang Shu to discuss their plan to capture Guan Qi. Meng Zun suggested that Zhang Shu act as bait to lure Guan Qi, but Zhang Shu seemed unsure. Meng Zun and Lei soon decided to wait for Zhang Shu's decision, even though he had asked them to leave his room. Meanwhile, at Zhang Shu's concubine's residence, she anticipated Zhang Shu's arrival but was shocked when Guan Qi showed up, killing all the guard soldiers and torturing her to draw out Zhang Shu. Meanwhile, Xiao Shi and Wenro visited Fuzi's home and found Sha Hua in distress. She had given her husband permission to confront Guan Qi, and Xiao Shi asked Wenro to take care of Cha Hua while he went to find Fuzi. In the midst of the fierce battle, Zhang Shu's concubine desperately tried to escape Guan Qi's relentless attacks. Eventually, she came face to face with Fu Zai. In that moment, Guan Qi seemed to recognize the elderly man standing before him, and without hesitation, they engaged in combat. Sadly, Fuzi's strength couldn't match his formidable opponents, and he had no choice but to accept defeat. As Fuzi lay dying from Guan Qi's spear attack, Xiao Shi finally arrived, his face filled with sorrow at the tragic scene. In his last moments, Fuzi entrusted Xiao Shi with the care of Cha Hua, his grieving wife. Xiao Shi carried Fuzi's lifeless body back home, burdened with guilt for arriving too late to save his beloved teacher. However, Xia Hua didn't hold Xiao Shi responsible and appeared to come to terms with her husband's passing. Meanwhile, Zhang Shu, who had initially been reluctant to act as bait for Guan Qi, had a change of heart after learning of Fuzi's death at the hands of the fierce warrior. He decided to cooperate with Meng Zun's plan. The next day, Meng Zun and the rest of the group gathered to say their final goodbye to Fuzi at his funeral. After paying their respects, they put their plan into action to catch Guan Qi with the help of Xiao Yao. Her brothel would be the place where they would set the trap. Meng Zun also warned Xiao Shi and Cho Fei not to kill Guan Qi, as he had important information about the Liu Finban sect's illegal activities. As evening approached, Xiao Yao got ready to go along with Guan Qi's plan for the ambush. However, it soon became clear that she had her own agenda. News spread about Zhang Shu being in the brothel, leading Meng Zun and the others to prepare for Guan Qi's expected arrival at the establishment. After finding out that Guan Qi was already inside the brothel, Zhang Shu, who had been working with the Lu Finban sect, prepared for the upcoming showdown with the swordsmen. The fight began, and Meng Zun, with his superior martial skills, quickly gained the upper hand over Guan Qi. However, he intentionally gave Guan Qi a chance to fight back fairly. Despite the combined efforts of four people, Guan Qi was overwhelmed. Just when he was about to be defeated, Xiao Yao suddenly appeared, carrying the injured swordsman away. She even set part of the brothel on fire to make sure Meng Zun and the others couldn't pursue them. Lei soon questioned why Xiao Yao had saved Guan Qi and Meng Zun, who knew about her connection to the Mitian guild, felt guilty about the failed plan to capture Guan Qi. In a quiet part of the city, a boy named Xiao Shuang, who lived with Xiao Yao, quietly made his way to a hidden house, where Xiao Yao was taking care of the injured Guan Qi. Seeing that Guan Qi had woken up, 
Xiao Shuang told Xiao Yao about it. Surprisingly, Xiao Shuang turned out to be Guan Qi's son. He expressed his wish to stay with Xiao Yao, knowing that he would eventually be reunited with his father once Guan Qi got better. Xiao Yao recalled how she had first met Guan Qi, who had saved her when she was about to be sold as a comfort woman. Since then, she had looked after Guan Qi and had also become responsible for Xiao Shuang. Meanwhile, Zhou Fei received a plaque from Wu Xie that would help him search for Guan Qi in different parts of the city. Wen Rou, who had spent the day with Cha Hua and was picked up by Xiao Xi, returned to the pavilion. During their journey, Xiao Xi noticed a dog and had the idea to use the dog's sense of smell to track down Xiao Yao. He brought the dog to the brothel and collected some of Xiao Yao's clothes to help the dog recognize her scent. Before embarking on this mission, Wen Rou, looking worried, asked him to come back safely. Using the dog's sharp nose, Xiao Xi started tracking down Xiao Yao. At the same time, Zhou Fei followed a horse-drawn carriage driven by Xiao Shuang to create a distraction and help Xiao Yao leave the city. Meanwhile, as Guan Qi traveled with Xiao Yao, he confronted her about her apparent betrayal of Meng Zun and the others. Xiao Yao explained that she couldn't let Guan Qi die, especially after she had almost been killed herself that night. This angered Guan Qi, and he started choking her. In her defense, she mentioned that she was taking care of his son and could be a better parent than he had been. This made Guan Qi even angrier, and he was about to kill her when Xiao Xi arrived just in time. Guan Qi and Xiao Xi had a fierce battle. Guan Qi, weakened from his injuries, was at a disadvantage and could have easily been defeated. But just when Xiao Xi was about to deliver a finishing blow, Xiao Yao begged him not to kill Guan Qi, echoing Meng Zun's earlier request. This plea made Xiao Xi change his mind about killing Guan Qi. After sparing Guan Qi, Xiao Xi asked about Zhang Xu's involvement with the Liu Finban sect's illegal activities. Guan Qi explained that Zhang Xu was selling weapons to the Liang country for their war against the Song country, which brought in significant profits for him and the sect. Since the government showed no signs of stopping the war, the demand for weapons would continue. Shortly after, Zhou Fei arrived with the intention of killing Guan Qi. Xiao Yao tried to intervene, but Zhou Fei attacked her instead, leading to her fatally injuring Guan Qi. Xiao Xi was upset by Zhou Fei's decision, especially because it cost Xiao Yao her life. Annoyed, Xiao Xi left the forest, carrying the injured Xiao Yao with him. After Cho Fei left, Lei Sun and Fei Jing showed up at the scene. Lei Sun told Fei Jing to take Wan Qi's head, which they'd brought to Zhang Shu. Zhang Shu was clearly angry and even spat on Guan Qi's severed head. Then, Lei Sun and Fei Jing returned the head for a proper burial. Back at Ying Khan's place, he received the news of Guan Qi's death. This disappointed him because he had hoped Guan Qi would be able to kill Lei Sun. Meanwhile, Meng Zun's health was getting worse in the pavilion, and this worried Wu Xie. Wu Xie bought various medicines for his friend. Lei Chun had originally planned to visit her mother's grave with Fei Jing. However, when she saw her father's sadness in front of the grave because he couldn't save Guan Qi, she decided to let him spend time there. She was relieved to see that he still remembered her mother. In the capital, Xiao Shuang took care of the injured Xiao Yao, and expressed his happiness at reuniting with his father. Back at the pavilion, Cho Fei felt regretful about hurting Xiao Yao while trying to kill Guan Qi. Meng Zun didn't blame Cho Fei, but he advised him to be more cautious when using his sword in battle. They then had a meeting with Xiao Xi and Wu Xie to discuss the movements of the Yukou group, which might be working with the Liu Finban sect to produce and sell weapons to countries at war. Meng Zun asked Wu Xie to investigate this matter. A few days later, after Xiao Yao had recovered, she planned to surrender to the Jinfan Rain Pavilion, expecting punishment and expulsion. However, during the sentencing process, Meng Zun suddenly stopped it, admitting that he also felt responsible for Xiao Yao's actions. Before she left, Wu Xie had a chance to express her appreciation for Xiao Yao's contributions to the pavilion. The next day, Cho Fei was still grieving Fuzi's death, and Xiao Xi and Wen Rou tried to comfort Cha Hua. In the city, Lei Chun went to buy plum sweets, 
but found out they had all been bought by someone else. She smiled, realizing who had done it. Later, she invited Xiao Xi and Cho Fei to the park in an attempt to reconcile them, but it didn't work, as the two young men chose to take a walk alone. At the Lufenban sect, Lei Chun was delighted to receive a plum candy from Meng Zun and reciprocated by sending him dozens of plum blossom plants. Yin Khan continued his efforts to meet his adoptive father, Go Yin, by entrusting his written work to one of Go Yin's confidants when Yu and Shan refused to allow the meeting. Meanwhile, Xiao Xi stumbled upon a writing competition in a park and praised a unique but poorly received piece of work by Ga Yin. Ga Yin, the author of the piece, was intrigued by Xiao Xi's abilities and asked him to collaborate on a paper. After they finished, Xiao Xi felt his work was less interesting compared to Gu Yin's writing. Impressed by Xiao Xi's skills, Gu Yin asked his bodyguard to take the paper home. On the way back, the arrogant bodyguard had a confrontation with Cho Fei, prompting Gu Yin to apologize to Cho Fei for his bodyguard's behavior. Cho Fei couldn't help but feel that there was something peculiar about Gu Yin. Meanwhile, Wenro, strolling by herself, unexpectedly crossed paths with Yin Khan. In their chat, Yin Khan asked why she once saw him as a swordsman when he had been viewed as a worthless boy in his youth. Wenro disclosed that Yin Khan's strength in overcoming a difficult past had made her recognize his potential. At Gun Yin's place, he encountered Yu and Shan, who presented Yin Khan's written work. However, Gun Yin favored Xiao Xi's work and asked Yu and Shan to showcase the young man's work that he had just come across in the park. In the evening, Cho Fei and Xiao Xi enjoyed a puppet show together. Wenro took the opportunity to subtly influence the puppet show's storyline, hoping it would help reconcile the two friends. When the performance concluded, Wenro initially felt disheartened to see Cho Fei and Xiao Xi leaving separately. She went to a tavern by herself, feeling down. To her surprise, both Xiao Xi and Cho Fei eventually joined her at the tavern, and it was clear that they had patched up their relationship. As a token of their gratitude for Wenro's efforts in bringing them together, Xiao Xi and Cho Fei gave her a gift. The next day, Cho Fei went to a market, and there the owner of a painting shop approached him. The shop owner told Cho Fei that his painting had been sold and gave him the money from the sale, along with a letter from the buyer. After reading the letter, Cho Fei discovered that Lei Chun had bought the painting. He rushed to find Xiao Xi to share this news, and Xiao Xi realized that Lei Chun had romantic feelings for Cho Fei. Meanwhile, in the Lufenban sect, Lei Sun was enjoying tea with his daughter Lei Chun. He complimented her tea and talked about Cho Fei, expressing his high opinion of him and allowing Lei Chun to spend time with him. Later, Lei Chun visited the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion and Wenro, who was aware of the visit, hurried to meet her. During their conversation, Wenro initially mistook Lei Chun for Tian Chun, but soon realized her true identity. Lei Chun asked for Wenro's assistance in conveying to Cho Fei that she didn't have romantic feelings for him, as she was in a relationship with Meng Zun. Wenro agreed to help with this and expressed her apprehension about explaining the situation to Cho Fei. After meeting Lei Chun, Cho Fei tried to express his feelings for her through a painting. However, she gently turned down his advances, explaining that her heart had been drawn to someone since childhood, someone she had met at a sweets shop. In response, Cho Fei rushed to the sweets shop to find out more about this person. The story then took us back 13 years ago, when Lei Sun from the Lufenban sect met with Zemu from the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion to discuss the possibility of a match between Lei Chun and Meng Zun. During their meeting, Lei Chun left the room for a stroll and ended up in front of the confectionery shop. Some individuals attempted to kidnap Lei Chun, but Meng Zun, who happened to be there, came to her rescue by bravely fighting off the group of men. Afterward, Meng Zun took Lei Chun away from the scene and emphasized that a swordsman's duty is to protect others. In the present, Cho Fei returns to the pavilion determined to confirm whether Meng Zun is the man Lei Chun had referred to. When he enters the pavilion leader's room, he spots the painting that Lei Chun had given to Meng Zun. This discovery breaks Cho Fei's heart, and he seeks comfort from Xiao Xi and Wenro. Xiao Xi sympathizes with his friend's pain, 
but advises him not to push his feelings and to accept the reality of the situation. Feeling dejected, Cho Fei decides to drown his sorrows in a tavern. On another day, Lei Soon invites Ying Khan to the Lufenban sect after learning about Ying Khan's involvement in Guan Qi's release from prison. He cautions Ying Khan against repeating such actions. After Ying Khan departs, Lei Soon discusses Ying Khan's act of feigning weakness despite possessing strong martial arts skills. He also reveals Ying Khan's intention to eliminate him to secure a position within the Yukao group. Lei Soon orders Fei Jin to go to the Pilla sect and bring back Lei Mei, who is fulfilling her duties there. Fei Jing follows Lei Soon's instructions, but he runs into a group of people from the Pilla sect who were intentionally gathered by Lei Mei to hinder him. Later, Lei Mei returns to her sect and has a conversation with Lei Soon, trying to justify her actions in recruiting these swordsmen to test Fei Jing's abilities. She claims it was to assess their strength, but Lei Soon sees through her motives and suspects she wants to replace Fei Jing in their sect. Lei Mei also seeks permission from Lei Soon to handle matters in the northern region. Meanwhile, in the pavilion, Meng Zun is with Lei Chun, explaining how his red crescent sword compensates for his physical weaknesses by enhancing his strength. Lei Chun hopes that if the Liu Finban sect and the pavilion can resolve their differences, their relationship will become smoother. However, Meng Zun feels a sense of sadness after their meeting, as he anticipates the challenges of maintaining their relationship amid the ongoing tension between the two factions. In the city, Zhou Fei hands over his painting to a shop owner and mentions that he might take a break from painting for a while. As he leaves the shop, he unexpectedly runs into Ying Khan, who is in a tough situation and being chased by some people. Zhou Fei steps in and helps resolve the issue, and in gratitude, Ying Khan invites him for tea. During their conversation, Cho Fei offers Ying Khan some advice, suggesting that he should stop pretending to be a weak young man because he knows that Ying Khan is skilled in martial arts. However, Ying Khan doesn't seem keen on taking that advice. Instead, he shares a map indicating the location of the weapons factory operated by the Lufenban sect. Cho Fei is puzzled why Ying Khan didn't give the map directly to Meng Zun, and Ying Khan explains that they both have faced similar challenges as marginalized individuals. He encourages Cho Fei to join their cause, as they share a common goal of confronting Lei Sun and Zhang Shu. At the same time, Xiao Shi is engrossed in painting a paper lantern, a gift he plans to give to Wenro. During this time, he comes across Xiao Shuang and decides to accompany the boy to Guan Qi's grave. As they chat, Xiao Shuang opens up about his childhood, explaining how he rarely got to spend time with Guan Qi. Xiao Shi understands his feelings, as he too experienced the absence of his own adoptive father, who was a soldier, during his early years. Meanwhile, over at the Lufenban sect, it seems that Lei Sun is preparing to travel to the northern region to oversee his weapons business. What's surprising is that Lei Mei is also in the carriage and insists on joining him, eventually convincing Lei Sun to let her come along. In the evening, Xiao Shi travels up to the northern region to dig into the shady dealings of the Liu Finban sect. He starts noticing some strange business activities happening in the area. Lei Sun, who's also made his way to the northern region, keeps a watchful eye on his workers from his chariot. Meanwhile, Cho Fei gathers a group of soldiers and decides to take matters into his own hands without waiting for Mum Zun's approval. When Lei Sun spots Xiao Shi in the region, he signals his men to hurry up with their deliveries, suggesting that the Liu Finban sect might be feeling the heat and urgency. Over at the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion, Wu Xie gets hold of a letter that spills the beans on the route of weapons being sold by the Liu Finban sect, and Cho Fei's plans to halt the flow of these arms all on his own. Upon hearing this, Meng Zun asks Wu Xie to set up an ambush against the Liu Finban sect. Simultaneously, he decides to intercept Cho Fei to prevent him from messing up the enemy's moves. Cho Fei and his troops launch an attack on a warehouse where the weapons are stashed, but they find themselves up against highly skilled sect warriors who easily overcome Cho Fei's men. Cho Fei ends up in a one-on-five showdown against these warriors, managing to win but sustaining injuries in the process. 
Shortly afterward, Fei Jing shows up and doesn't seem pleased with Cho Fei, hinting that he might want to get rid of pavilion members. But as luck would have it, Mum Zun arrives, causing Fei Jing to back off. Meanwhile, Lei Sun comes across Xiao Shi in the northern region and questions why he's there. He also reminds Xiao Shi of the mistake they made that led to Guan Qi's release, which caused a lot of trouble in the past. Frustrated, Xiao Shi decides to leave the scene. Lei soon heads to a warehouse with a hidden room where weapons are being made. When he and Lei may get inside, Lei soon intends to wreck the warehouse and get rid of all the workers because the pavilion has now found out where the weapons are being produced. At the same time, Wu Xie and his team successfully ambush the Liu Finban sex weapon delivery train, causing all the weapons to blow up. Meng Zun, who's been watching from a distance, is pleased with the mission's success. Lei Sun, on the other hand, seems pretty upset with how things turned out. When Xiao Shi got back to the pavilion, he had a talk with Meng Zun about why Cho Fei did what he did in the northern region, like acting on his own without telling anyone. Cho Fei explained that he got the info from Ying Khan, which made Meng Zun advise him to be careful with Ying Khan, who might have hidden intentions. But Cho Fei got even more upset and said that despite being the vice president, he didn't have a say in pavilion matters, they argued, and Cho Fei said that their brotherly relationship had changed. The next day, Zhang Xu met with Gu Yin, who was also known as Prime Minister Kai, and was a key figure in the illegal arms business of a warring country. Zhang Xu apologized for the failed weapons delivery the previous night, and Gu Yin told him to fix the problem fast. Zhang Xu, trying to avoid blame, tried to put it on the Liu Finban sect. While Lei Sun, with Lei Mei by his side, suspected her of leaking info about their weapons shipments, she denied it and said she always followed Lei Sun's orders. Later, Lei Mei went to a place of worship and met with Meng Zun in secret. She admitted to sending a letter to Wu Xie about the weapons delivery route during their conversation. Meng Zun warned her to be careful because Lei Sun wouldn't just stay quiet after what happened the previous night. At the Lufenban sect, Zhang Shu got really upset and wanted all the gifts he gave to the sect back because they messed up the weapons delivery. He asked Lei Sun to account for those items, but Lei Sun threatened that Zhang Shu would still get in trouble. Lei Sun even suggested they should get rid of Meng Zun instead. On the other hand, Lei Chun thought the explosion from the other night might be linked to her sect, but Fei Jin couldn't spill the beans about their illegal activities. After his meeting with the Liu Finban sect, Zhang Shu went back to the Prime Minister and talked about his plan to deal with Meng Zun. Gun Yin realized that it was Lei Sun's idea, not Zhang Shu's. In a house on a hill, Cho Fei met with Ying Khan to vent his frustration, blaming Ying Khan for putting his life at risk the previous night. Cho Fei challenged Ying Khan to a game where they risked their lives. Calmly, Ying Khan agreed and said both of them wanted the top position. Cho Fei got mad and didn't want to be compared to Ying Khan, warning him that if he kept cheating, he'd never be a hero. After Cho Fei won the game, he left Ying Khan's place. Now let's shift our focus to Lei Sun, who's pretty upset about the messed up weapons delivery. Lei Chun, his daughter, tries to comfort him when she sees him so distressed. Lei Sun opens up and tells her that he was forced into some shady business by the government or they'd ruin the sect. This shady stuff also made him break off Lei Chun's engagement with Meng Zun. Hearing all this, Lei Chun tries to make her dad feel better and promises to talk to Meng Zun about sparing him. Over at the pavilion, Ying Khan pays a visit and challenges Xiao Shi to a wrestling match. Xiao Shi agrees, but during the match, Ying Khan plays dirty by using a hidden weapon to hurt Xiao Shi. Furious, Xiao Shi beats Ying Khan and warns him to stay away from their group. Ying Khan gets more and more angry at Xiao Shi, especially when he sees that Wenro is interested in him. Back to Lei Chun, she meets up with Meng Zun as a representative of her sect and begs him to forgive her dad for the shady business. After thinking it over, Meng Zun, not wanting the woman he loves to suffer, agrees to her request. Her plea works, but Lei Chun feels really sad because her relationship with Meng Zun has been used for her sex gain. When Lei Chun gets back to her place, she overhears Lei Sun and Fei Jing 
talking about plans to kill Meng Zun. She's shocked and doesn't get a chance to warn Meng Zun. Fei Jing locks her up. That night, Fei Jing tries to connect with Lei Chun by sharing his story from when he was a kid. He tells her how Lei Sun and his wife saved him, which made him want to protect the sect. Lei Chun admits that she also thinks of Fei Jing as family. Meanwhile, Lei Sun meets Cho Fei at a shop and suggests they work together to get rid of Meng Zun and make Cho Fei the pavilion's owner. The next day, Xiao Shi and Wen Ro start getting worried when Cho Fei doesn't come back to the pavilion. After looking for him, they find Cho Fei in a tavern. He explains that he's decided not to return to the pavilion, and though Xiao Shi wishes he wouldn't, he asks that they still stay on good terms. Over at the Lu Finban sect, Lei Chun's servant secretly gives a sleeping potion to the person in charge of her room. This sneaky move makes the room keeper all drowsy, allowing Princess Lei Chun to slip away from the sect without anyone noticing. She wants to warn Meng Zun about her dad's evil plans. When she gets to the city, Lei Chun sees Wenro and asks her to come along. Sadly, Fei Jing and his group figure out where Lei Chun is and knock Wenro out. Then Fei Jing takes her to an inn and gets ready to go after Meng Zun. On a snowy night, Xiao Shi seems to leave the place where Cho Fei is staying, and Meng Zun gets an invite from Lei Chun. Meanwhile, Ying Khan is seen tending to his injuries from his fight with Xiao Shi. At the inn, Lei Chun suddenly hears a commotion. When she looks outside, she sees the guards have been beaten. So, she saves the unconscious Wenro and tries to get away. But in a hallway, they bump into a masked person they didn't expect to see. Now let's focus on Meng Zun. Even though he had some doubts about a possible trap set by Lei Sun, he decided to go to the planned meeting. When he got to the meeting spot, Lei Sun brought up the idea of the pavilion and his sect working together to get rid of the Yukio group. But Meng Zun said no to this idea, which made hidden warriors suddenly appear and attack him. At the same time, Xiao Shi found Wenro's necklace on the ground. Meanwhile, that persistent masked person kept going after Lei Chun and Wenro, trying to scare Wenro. Lei Chun, being brave, stood up to the masked person to protect her friend, even though it put her in danger. But this made the masked person focus on Lei Chun instead. When Xiao Shi got to the corridor, the masked person quickly left, so he checked on Wenro to make sure she was okay. Even though he offered to help Lei Chun, she said no and asked him to save Meng Zun, who was the one her dad wanted to hurt. The masked person took off their mask and left, revealing a swordsman dressed in white. A little later, Xiao Shi and Cho Fei rushed to help Meng Zun. When they got there, Lei Sun and Fei Jing realized they couldn't beat Meng Zun together. So, Lei Sun suggested a one-on-one -on -one fight with Meng Zun. During the fight, Fei Jing suddenly pushed Lei Sun into a building that had explosives rigged inside, hoping to trap Meng Zun. The building blew up in a big explosion, and Lei Sun was thrown into a nearby lake. After that, Meng Zun and the others left, and Fei Jing quickly rescued Lei Sun from the water. Back at the pavilion, Lei Chun had a hard time dealing with what had happened to her. Feeling hurt by the mistreatment she had endured, she asked Wen Ro to keep it a secret from everyone else. Meanwhile, Meng Zun's health got worse after the tough fight the night before, making Wu Xie really worried about him. As Meng Zun started getting better, he tried to talk to Lei Chun, but she avoided him. In another sad moment, Lei Chun found out that her father had died because of the explosion caused by Fei Jing's betrayal. She was really sad and remembered Fei Jing's promise to protect her family, which made her miss her dad even more. On the other side, hidden away in a forest hideout, Lei Sun, surprisingly alive, scolded Fei Jing for his actions that had nearly killed him. Fei Jing suggested a plan for Lei Sun to pretend to be dead and wait for the right time for revenge while ensuring Lei Chun's happiness. After that, they set off on a journey to a secret refuge. On the way, Lei Sun took Fei Jing to visit his father's grave, which made Fei Jing remember all the kindness and care he had received from Lei Sun and his wife, who he had come to think of as his own parents. Back at the pavilion, Meng Zun gathered Xiao Shi and Cho Fei for a meeting. He talked about hosting a big feast to symbolize the unity of all the sects in the capital and warned about the possibility of Lei Sun still being alive. 
Meanwhile, Lei Soon went to a warehouse to check on the coffin intended for his fake death at the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion's banquet. In another part of the city, Lei Mei initially celebrated the news of Lei Soon's death. However, her happiness was short-lived when Dong Tian told her that Lei Soon was actually alive, and she immediately called everyone together. Shortly after, the grand banquet began at the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Sect representatives congratulated Meng Zun for successfully bringing together the capital sects. From a higher place, Xiao Shi and Chou Fei watched the event. Unexpectedly, the Liu Finban sect arrived with a coffin, and Lei Soon attacked Meng Zun. In the midst of the chaotic battle, Lei Mei, driven by her long-held grudge against Lei Sun, tried to harm the sect leader. Realizing he was running out of strength, Lei Sun admitted defeat and intentionally impaled himself with Meng Zun's sword, ending his own life. Lei Chun, who witnessed this tragic scene, was devastated, as was Meng Zun, who never intended to kill Lei Chun's father. After his confrontation with Lei Sun, Meng Zun's health deteriorated further, prompting Mu Xie to call for a healer to examine him thoroughly. During this time, the Liu Finban sect was mourning, and at Lei Sun's final tribute ceremony, Lei Chun made an announcement. She stated that she had passed the leadership position to Fei Jing, who urged everyone to remain calm and avoid rushing into revenge against the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. The sect members then carried out the funeral rites for Lei Sun. On the way, Zhang Xu paid his respects by offering money, and even Mu Xie and other members of the pavilion paid their last respects to the fallen hero, Lei Sun. Dong Tian and the sect members seemed unhappy with the pavilion members, but they managed to control their anger toward the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. Meanwhile, Lei Mei went to a liquor store where she met Shou Fei. Lei Mei confessed that despite achieving her revenge, she still felt sadness. Chou Fei advised her to strive for a better life and pursue happiness. Back in the pavilion, Meng Zun and Xiao Shi talked about Chou Fei's plan to leave. Xiao Shi assured Meng Zun that their brotherly bond would remain strong even if Chou Fei left the pavilion. Meng Zun then asked about Xiao Shi's future plans, and Xiao Shi explained that he only wanted to investigate his mother's death and make a positive contribution to the martial world. Upon hearing this, Meng Zun offered Xiao Shi the position of pavilion leader, but Xiao Shi declined, saying he could achieve his goals without holding that position. On another occasion, Chou Fei was in Meng Zun's room, admiring a painting. However, Meng Zun entered, coughing, and Chou Fei encouraged him to rest. Meng Zun assured him he was okay, and mentioned that he had discovered the painting Lei Chun had given was actually crafted by Chou Fei. He expressed his sadness at not having the chance to meet her, even after her father's passing. It was during this conversation that Chou Fei shared his plan to leave the pavilion. On a different day, Xiao Shi arranged a meeting for Meng Zun, Chou Fei, Wenro, and Lei Chun. During the meeting, Xiao Shi talked about his defense sword, symbolizing their brotherly bond. Lei Chun, who had just arrived, mentioned that she knew the sword's story, which included lovers like her and Meng Zun, who couldn't be together. After this statement and turning down Meng Zun's offer of wine, Lei Chun, who had ended her romantic relationship with Meng Zun, left the gathering. A few days later, Yuan Shan arrived at the Liu Fenban sect to introduce the new sect leader. Lei Chun didn't seem to approve because the government now controlled the sect. However, Fei Jing tried to calm her down. That night, to Lei Chun's shock, the new sect leader tried to make her his wife and Fei Jing rushed to help her. Unfortunately, he couldn't confront Yuan Shan, who was guarding Lei Chun's room. Inside the room, Lei Chun was reminded of her traumatic past when a masked figure abused her. In a sudden and shocking turn of events, she transformed into a ruthless figure and killed the new sect leader. Yuan Shan, who saw this, instructed her to meet with the Prime Minister the following morning to account for her actions. After Yuan Shan left, Fei Jing hurried to comfort her as she sobbed in distress outside the room. The next day, Lei Chun met with Ga Yin and talked about making amends for her actions. Ga Yin suggested she replace her father, Lei Sun, and work for the government. After the meeting, Lei Chun lost herself in playing her harp, reflecting on her father's advice to seek Chou Fei's help if she wanted revenge. 
She planned to follow her father's guidance. Meanwhile, Cho Fei, who was drinking, got a message from a waiter informing him about Lei Chun's mission to Chuha village, as ordered by Gao Yin. In the evening, Cho Fei gathered Xiao Shi and Wenro for a painting session, but he only managed to finish a portrait of the two friends that night. He planned to add his own image to the painting once he returned from Chuha village. On the day of departure, Fei Jing could only accompany Lei Chun to the city gate before returning to guard the sect. After saying goodbye to Lei Chun, Cho Fei got ready for his journey and bid farewell to Xiao Shi at the gate. At that moment, Xiao Shi earnestly asked Cho Fei to return safely to the capital. Meanwhile, at a temple, there was a swordsman named Zhu Ga Zhengwo, who happened to be the brother of Xiao Shi's and Yuan Shan's teacher. He appeared to be diligently practicing his martial arts. At the same time, at Gao Yin's residence, Zhang Shu expressed concerns about their illegal business being exposed by the Jinfeng Rain Pavilion. He proposed a plan to set a trap for the pavilion. Zhang Shu and Gao Yin agreed to manipulate Xiao Shi into killing Zhang Wo. This way, they would have an excuse to take down the pavilion. As part of their plan, Yu and Shan, who was about to meet Xiao Shi, suddenly attacked him using a martial arts move similar to Xiao Shi's teacher's style. After a chat, Yu and Shan invited Xiao Shi to meet Ga Yin for a further discussion. They wanted to reveal that Zheng Wo was the leader of the Yukio group. Xiao Shi was skeptical at first, but Ga Yin called in Zhang Shu, who claimed to be a member of the group, to confirm that Zheng Wo was indeed the leader. After coming back from Ga Yin's place, Xiao Shi seemed down, even ignoring Wenro's greeting. In his room, Xiao Shi thought about Ga Yin's advice to visit Gang Wazi on the outskirts of the capital. Without much thought, he went there and spoke with a trader who complained about high taxes. Soon after, a group carrying a man named Mr. Zhang in a palanquin passed by. Xiao Shi tried to stop them to ask about their business, but they threatened to arrest him if he kept obstructing Zhang's journey. He reluctantly let them pass, but a middle-aged man in the group took a moment to chat with Xiao Shi. Later, at a nearby liquor store, the owner intentionally poisoned the middle-aged man to prevent him from revealing their secrets. Everyone in the alley was involved in the conspiracy to deceive Xiao Shi, so they quickly got rid of the man's body. On another occasion, Xiao Shi met with Fei Jing to discuss the leader of the Yukio group. During their talk, Fei Jing warned Xiao Shi to be careful because the investigation was dangerous. They both suspected that Gao Yin might be behind the Yukio group, manipulating Xiao Shi for his own purposes. Fei Jing also advised Xiao Shi to be cautious around people he couldn't fully trust, as some might be spying for the Prime Minister. The next day, unable to meet with Mun Zun due to the pavilion leader's declining health, Xiao Shi ran into Wu Xie. Sensing the presence of spies, Xiao Shi deliberately shared information with Wu Xie, revealing that Zheng Wo was the leader of the Yukio group. He gave Wu Xi instructions on how to verify this information. Inside the pavilion, Wu Xie expressed his concerns about Xiao Shi's recent strange behavior to Wenro, who also noticed the change in Xiao Shi. She tried to approach him, but he remained distant and mentioned Zheng Wo as the leader of the Yukio group, knowing he was being watched by a spy. Meanwhile, Zhou Fei had a meeting with Lei Chun in Chuha village. During their conversation, Lei Chun shared her plans to seek help and visit the Pilla sect. Seeking solace in the Sinha pavilion, Xiao Shi was surprised by the return of Xiao Yao to the capital. She expressed no regret for saving Guan Qi, even though it led to her expulsion from the pavilion. Xiao Yao believed in following one's convictions to find happiness without regrets and encouraged Xiao Shi to do the same. At the same time, Xiao Shuang told Wenro that Xiao Shi was at the Sinha Pavilion. Wenro went there to find him, but he remained distant and cold, leaving her feeling sad. The next day, Cho Fei and Lei Chun reached the Pilla sect and saw a disturbing sight, a person hanging in front of the sect's gate. They had a meeting with Lei Tian, the son of the sixth sect leader. During their talk, they discussed the division within the sect, which had split into two groups. Cho Fei suggested a plan to get rid of Lei Yi, the leader of the opposing faction, so that Lei Tian could take full control of the sect. In the evening, Lei Chun went to the sect's prison where Lei Tian had imprisoned Lei Yi. 
It was there that Lei Tian revealed his true goal, which was to avenge the deaths of his five brothers, all killed by Cho Fei. Soon after, Cho Fei approached the sex gate, where Lei Tian was hiding, ready to attack Lei Yi. Along the way, Cho Fei noticed many hidden soldiers. When he let his guard down, Lei Tian launched an attack. Cho Fei found himself facing Lei Tian and his troops alone. Thankfully, Lei Chun stepped in and led him to a bridge as an escape route. However, they ended up surrounded and decided to jump into the river. Towards the end of the story, Lei Chun and Cho Fei faced a tough situation. Lei Chun suggested they quickly return to the Pilla sect. She had managed to free Lei Yi, and with his help, she weakened Lei Tian's forces. Lei Chun took decisive action, executing several soldiers who resisted her efforts. Eventually, through her determination, Lei Tian's troops were persuaded to join her cause, becoming her loyal followers. The End So the moral of the story is if you ever find yourself in a river surrounded by vengeful sect leaders, remember to bring a life jacket and a bag of marshmallows for unexpected s'mores diplomacy.